Hello and welcome back to the GCN Racing News Show. Coming up this week, early celebrations, pro cyclists turn runners, a new name for Vinegar, and a whole host of racing to wrap up. I'll be looking back at the Volta Algarve, the Vuelta Andalusia that totaled all of five kilometres, Otvar, the Volta Valenciana, and the final cyclocross races of the season. This week in the world of racing, we were reminded again that you should never celebrate before the finish line. Victory is here, second of the year for Unix Mobility. Ooh. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa! <laughs> uh, so got it on the he, line. he got it, and this is a <laughs> this is a classic case of celebrating too early, Matt. To be fair to Tobias Johansson, there it looked like he'd simply mistaken where the finish line was. Another rookie error, you might say. But the gantry he raced to did actually say Arrive on it. However, the finish line was a few metres further on, weirdly. Either way, he's not going to live that one down for a while. We also learned that whilst Wout van Aert is as hard as nails, his tyres aren't. This was the picture he posted to Instagram after last week's Classica Hayen Pareso race. Well, I think actually that is a screw isn't it? Not a nail. But anyway, finally, we learned that Bauke Mollema is pretty blooming good at running. He did a 31-minute 10K just over a week ago, a time that was just a few seconds off the world record that was set 100 years ago. Um, it's now five minutes off the current world record, but to be fair, that is still super rapid. Right, let's get on to the Volta ao Algarve in Portugal, the most anticipated race of last week due to the star-studded field in attendance this year. A messy finale to stage one was perfectly navigated by Gerben Thiessen, giving Intermarche their third win of the year. It was so messy, it's worth replaying you the overhead shots. Here is Thiessen, just in picture, but he soon gets pushed so far out of position that we can't see him on camera. But here he is again, riding like a human pinball between other riders and on to victory. It was on day two that we got the first GC action. All eyes were on Remco Evenepoel for the summit finish at Alto da Foya. It is a climb that often sees a decent sized group still fighting it out for victory at the top. And this year was no different, despite some additional climbs added into the stage. Evenepoel made his move in the closing few hundred meters, but not only was he matched by Danny Martinez, he was passed. Now, I don't think anyone expected that, not least Evenepoel himself, who came on leaps and bounds in this sprint finish last year. The only other bunch sprint came on stage three, and it had a surprise winner, Wout van Aert which might not sound like much of a surprise, but he wasn't even supposed to be sprinting himself. He'd clearly said before the stage that he wouldn't do so and just wanted to stay out of trouble, but I guess there is no better way of staying out of trouble than being in front of everyone else. That was his first road win of 2024 and his earliest ever pro win on the road. Now that is mainly because he's never raced this early on the road before though, as he's normally on a short break after his cyclocross season at this time of year. In the time trial on day four, Evenpool started as the big favorite, despite the caliber of the other time trial specialists there, and he duly delivered. Not everyone can spin a 62-tooth chainring over an undulating course, but that is exactly what he did, averaging close to 49 kilometers per hour for the 22 kilometers, taking his first ever time trial win in his rainbow jersey of elite world champion. Magnus Sheffield put in a stellar ride there too, finishing second on the day at 16 seconds, with Kung third almost half a minute back. The other notable performance of the day came from Isaac Del Toro of UAE. There has been a lot of speculation as to exactly how good he could be after his win at the Tour Down Under, and his ride in the time trial will have done nothing to quash that. In fact, let's add to it, shall we? Fourth there, beating the likes of Ganna and Van Aert, is another indication that we have a potential superstar on our hands. And let's not forget, he's only 20 years old and less than two months into his first pro contract. With Sheffield and Del Toro having already lost significant time the previous day though, it left Venpool in a commanding position on GC, 47 seconds in front of Martinez and over a minute in front of Tratnik and Van Aert going into the final day. So we were left wondering whether there wouldn't be much action on the final day 
or whether teams would throw the kitchen sink at trying to dethrone Evenepoel. Thankfully, it was the latter, although not literally. It was a real belter of a stage. A group of over 20 riders formed the early breakaway, albeit one that took 65 kilometers to go clear. And then at 40K to go, Van Aert attacked. Ben Healy latched onto that move, and with the help of Visma's Per Strand Hagenes, they were soon at the front of the race and putting real pressure on Quick Step. Some fantastic work by that team put the fire out eventually, but they really had to work for it. In the end, a select group fought it out for the win, and it wasn't dissimilar to stage two. Evenepoel went first, Martinez went with him, and then beat him on the line. Quite comfortably, actually. And I got the impression that Evenepoel was quite surprised by that. I would be too, to be fair, if I was Evenepoel. But clear evidence that Danny Martinez is on fire at the moment. In his post-race interview, Evenepoel did say, though, that he'd been stuck in his big chain ring for the final climb, which affected him in the sprint. But with the way that Martinez is going, it would have been very hard to beat him anyway, you'd think. Now, those two were head and shoulders above the rest, really, over the five days, whilst Tratnik completed the GC podium. For Evenepoel, it was his 12th professional stage race victory. Only four active pros have won more. Pogacar has got 13, Froome on 17, whilst... Actually, I'm going to let you guess who has more. I will tell you the answer at the end, just to give you a little bit of time to think. Uh, now, two riders, remember, you still need to guess. It was also Evenepoel's third overall win in Algarve from three participation. So he is pretty consistent there, isn't he? What did we learn from the race? Well, we learned that Evenepoel is already on winning form. But then again, when isn't he? We were also reminded that Danny Martinez can't half sprint and we had confirmation that Isaac Del Toro is going to be a world-class beast on a bike in the not-too-distant future if he isn't already. Now, apart from that, we didn't learn too much. It is still so early in the season that it would be silly to read too much into anyone's form. It is still a fair few weeks to the first big appointments of the season. As you'll have gathered at the top of the show, there is not a lot for me to summarise with this year's Ruta del Sol or Vuelta a Andalusia, as it is now known. Due to farmer strikes in the local area, there weren't enough police available to ensure the safety of the race. Initially, the first stage was cancelled, then the second, and in the end, all we had was a five kilometer long individual time trial on Friday. Now you have got to feel sorry for the organizers there. That is a huge undertaking to run a pro stage race. Let's just hope that there is no long-term negative impact on that. Anyway, there was a dominant win there that day. Tim Wellens started as the main favorite but could only manage fifth on the day. One rider there was head and shoulders above the rest though. Maxim van Hils of Lotto Destiny took a full 10 seconds out of second place Juan Ayuso to take what I suppose we can say was the stage and the general classification, which is quite something to win a five-day stage race in the space of eight minutes, isn't it? Now, on to the Vuelta Valenciana now, which marked a successful return to competition for Elisa Balsamo of Little Trek. The former world champion took two stage wins here last year, and 12 months later, she returned to do the same, bookending the race with bunch sprint wins. On day one, she beat Mariana Voss, and then Arlena Sierra yesterday after what was a pretty hectic final few kilometers to the line. Now, even if you didn't watch the race, it wouldn't take too much to correctly guess which team dominated the general classification. Yes, SD works, despite no volering, or Capecchi, they dominated both the GC days, and in fact, it was the first of those that turned out to be where the race was won. Marlon Rusa attacked with 6K to go, but crossed the line almost half a minute clear of the next group on the road, led in by Mariana Voss. And it is great to see her back on good form, incidentally. On Saturday, the queen stage of the race, Neve Fisher Black followed an attack from Gaia Riolini, who she later dropped, going on to take her first win of the season. To make the day even better, Rusa crossed the line with enough time to conserve the leader's jersey, eight seconds in front of Cassia Nuiadoma. Now in France, we kind of had two races for the price of one. The Tour des Alpes Maritimes et Duvar three-day race is now a one-day, followed by a two-day. Now, no idea why. Maybe they hoped the extra UCI points would lure some bigger names down there. Anyway, you have already seen the results of the classic VAR. Tobias Johansson was 
pipped to the actual finish line by Lenny Martinez of Groupama FTJ. In the two-day race, Ethan Vernon ticked his first win of the year off on day one, but didn't celebrate as he thought there might still be a rider up the road. <laughs> you couldn't write it, could you? The GC was decided on stage two, though, in what ended up in a reduced sprint. A very successful reduced sprint for Decathlon Agile Desert, in fact, who finished 1-2 with Benoit Cosnefroy, who took the stage and the overall, with teammate Aurélien Paré-Peintre taking second on the stage and third overall. That my pronunciation? Yeah, it was good, wasn't it? Anyway, at least, um, hopefully I got it right. Anyway, that'd be two names out of an entire show. Uh, right, just a quick summary of the Classica Hain Pareso race now, as it's already a week ago that it took place. There was quite an incredible performance there from Movistar's Oyer Lazanko. I've probably undone all my pronunciation in one name. The Spanish champion formed part of the early breakaway, albeit one that took an hour to form, and despite a chase from the likes of Ineos and Visma, he held on for the win. His numbers for the race were absolutely crazy. I've got to say, his average power for three hours 44, and that's average, not normalized, was 358. Normalized, that works out at 409 watts with a peak five minutes of 514 watts and a peak 20 minutes of 457 watts. A few years ago, those numbers would have been impressive at the Tour de France, let alone in February. So watch that lad at the Classics this year. Finally, at the Tour of Oman, Adam Yates ran away with victory on Green Mountain and the overall classification. According to Amati Pierre Ali on Twitter, Yates broke the record time on the ascent as well, which had been set by Van Sevenant and Jorgensen 12 months ago. He starts the UAE Tour today as the big favourite for the overall classification. The last few stages in Oman were all cut short due to the weather, probably leaving most of the riders there short on training unless they went out and did a little bit extra to themselves. On Green Mountain, there was heartbreak for young Hoob Arts, who was part of the early breakaway. He was the last survivor and almost pulled it off, but ended up third on the day. The 21-year-old is on the Intermarché development team, but was allowed to ride with the World Tour team in Oman, and he certainly gave it his all, as this picture from the team shows. We'll be seeing more of him without doubt, I shouldn't imagine. Now, a quick wrap up of the final cyclocross races of the season now, which marked the return of Toon Etz after a two year suspension. On Saturday at the exact cross, he was in the thick of the action, eventually finishing fourth at just 12 seconds behind the winner, Michael Van Tornout. He finished fourth again yesterday at the X20 in Brussels, albeit close to two minutes down on Ellie Isabet. Lars van der Haar took overall victory in the series. In the women's races, Lucinda Brand took back-to-back -back victories, but despite her absence, Fem van Empel took a comfortable win in the overall classification of the X20. In other news, Jonas Vinegar has a new name. Lucas Ronald spotted this on the UCI website where his name is now Jonas Vinegar Hansen, apparently having taken the name of his wife, Trini Marie's surname. ASO revealed the wildcard entries for the Vuelta last week. Israel Premier Tech and Lotto Destiny got automatic invitations through their rankings, whilst Yuskeltel and Kern Farmer get the final two spots. Fashion news now. Yep, you heard that right. The leader's jersey of this year's Au Gran Camino, which will be Vinegar's first race of the season and in which he won most of the leader's jersey last year, are produced by Zara. We spotted this on the Marker website where it says that Zara is the most profitable company in Spain. So there you go. You learn something new every day. Finally, who are the two current riders who have won the most stage races? Potentially, you're going to be learning something else new here today as well. I will put you out of your misery. It is Roglic and Quintana, both on 20 stage race victories. Right, that is all for this week from the Racing News Show. You can breathe a sigh of relief because Dan will be back with you this time next Monday.